Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, today is Thursday, November 3rd, and this is our community call. Uh, we will be kicking off shortly uh, with Lucas from Otter Space presenting on uh, Otter Space and their tool, uh, as well as then kind of having a wider discussion on uh, SoBound tokens and, and identity in that sense. Uh, before we get there, we'll just do a little bit of housekeeping in case there are any other uh, meetings or anything else going on. Um, yeah, I don't know, Paul or anyone else, are there any, any meetings folks should be aware of? So tomorrow we have the chat guild meeting at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we'll be talking about some changes in Discord and um, probably some just general discussion about what we would like there to be in um, chat and like chat culture and, and that things along those lines. Uh, so that's going on. Uh, I also just made, because we are now three whole days into November, um, I just made the comment of the month thread. So if you'd like to nominate comments that are showing up um, on the forum in the month of November, here is the thread to make those nominations so we can get that going. And then also by the end of the day today, uh, I will have the poll set up so that you can vote on comment of the month from October. So um, that thread, it will hopefully um, now be closed and you can do new nominations in the November one, but we will have the poll in the old one and so I will make sure to try to keep those uh, URLs clean and separate for people. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else have any other uh, community, uh, any announcements for the SCURF community, other activities folks should be aware of? Uh, yes, Yvonne. Yes, I just wanted to remind everybody to <clears throat> listen to our latest podcast episode that dropped yesterday. So it is the first one in the series about block science with uh, Matt Barling and Jeff Emmett talking about engineering methodology. It's both on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Great. Thank you, Yvonne. And I realize we should make sure to remind them that that had started happening last week because uh, I might have forgotten to nudge them on that. Um, but yeah, thank you for reminding about the podcast. I'll just quickly say for the community calls going forward next week, we'll just have more of a skirt focused conversation. Uh, of, uh, we had a previous call focusing on kind of potential future visions and where we headed. Uh, and then next week, we'll also kind of come back to uh, what does that mean for kind of projects and activity in the near term and how it relates to uh, yeah, to kind of where we're at today with SCURF. And the week after that, we will have Chris uh, from Block Science Labs presenting on smart papers. Uh, and they'll actually have uh, one of the groups they worked with on their first research paper. Uh, and uh, yeah, they, they will kind of uh, talk about both the paper specifically a little bit and about smart papers as a specific tool type. Uh, where it's cool it's for some of the graphs, you could actually uh, kind of play with the variables to see what kind of effect it would have. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I think that covers it for all the general housekeeping. If, if, I, if we missed anything, please feel free to drop that in the chat. Uh, apologies for the barking dog. Uh, and yeah, with that, I think, Lucas, I will hand it off to you uh, to maybe do a quick introduction uh, and then present on Otter Space. Awesome. Thank you, Eugene. And yeah, thanks, everybody, for, for, for having us. Uh, very excited to, to be here. And yeah, so sorry, give me just one second. I um, yeah. So yeah, I'd love to give you all kind of a background on, on Otter Space, um, what we do. Myself, I'm Lucas, uh, Chief of Staff at Otter Space. Um, yeah, working on all things partnerships. I understand this is a a an environment um, you know with with also a lot of technical expertise. So I will, I'll try to do my best uh, on the on the technical front, not being on the engineering team myself. But I think I have. Um, some understanding of of how um, yeah how the underlying tech works and um, you know obviously if there are very specific questions I can also try to um, yeah get back on on, on yeah very specific um, technical questions and yeah I think I had the the pleasure um, me and Rahul um, tech co-founder had the pleasure um, a couple of weeks ago at DevCon to meet Rene so Rene great great to see you again and yeah with that. Being said, maybe just one quick question, Eugene. How many? Uh, how much time do I have, approximately, just to orient myself? 
Yeah, so we have the rest of the hour for the call overall. Uh, if you, I mean, feel free to take your time. Usually it's sort of 10, 15, 20 minutes on on presenting and then the rest of the time just discussion. Uh, but yeah, feel free to, to kind of use that balance to your discretion. Okay, perfect. So what I think we can do um, to give you kind of the, the, the full picture is um, to walk you just a bit through the, the background of, you know, what we're trying to do and why. Um, and the broader context. And then I can also give you um, yeah, a demonstration of or a demo walkthrough of uh, what we're building. So you also get like a visual feeling for, for what we're trying to achieve because we're doing multiple things in, in concert. Um, and so with that being said, I would go ahead and, and share my screen. And please do let me know once you can see it. And also let me know how the audio is because I've been having some trouble with my microphone lately. So yeah, no, the video is coming through. We see welcome to Otter Space, and yeah, so far the the audio has been coming through crisp, at least on my end. If anyone is having any kind of issues or anything, please just mention in chat or or let us know. Perfect. Thanks, Eugene. And if you have any questions along the the journey, please feel free to you know message in the chat. I have it open here, so I can I can also see it. Um, and also, you know, feel free to to speak up and and, and, and yeah, voice your questions. So, with that being said, welcome to Outer Space. So, what we're doing in Outer Space, in I would say in in the simplest term, is we're trying to bring the benefits of non-transferable tokens or Soban tokens, as you also might know them, or badges, as uh, we call them, to tokenized communities and DAOs of all shapes and sizes. And yeah, why why did we choose to to um, develop badges? You know, based on this this Solbon token concept, and the the idea has been around for for I would say a couple of years. But with the the white paper released earlier this year um, by Pooja Oliver, Glenn Wall, and and Vitalik Buterin, kind of the, the topic was also I would say brought onto a wider stage and and um, gained a lot of yeah a lot of traction. And we were actually coincidentally working on um, a token standard at the same time, just around the same time of the, the paper release, and uh, released EIP 4973 shortly after. I think there was like within one or two days of the, the paper release, the, the token standard was released. Um, and, and this brings me in, in very rough terms to kind of the three things that we're doing in concert. And I'm going to show you some, some things in a moment, but just for you to orient yourself. So, we are one co-authoring a token standard, which is EIP four nine seven three. So that's account bound tokens. And let me just um, message that here in the group. That sometimes it's confusing on the EIP numbers. Then, secondly, we're building an, yeah, a protocol. Um, so a yeah, set of uh, smart contracts for you to interact basically with the token standard, uh, create badges, distribute badges, um, and a, a variety of like ancillary functions around that and then in an environment where you have development capacities you can also interact with the protocol directly um, but in addition to kind of get communities started right away with badges and also support communities of you know various sizes and, and various um, levels of technical you know, expertise and, and availability we're also building an, an app which is the outer space app, which lets you then kind of, it's a front end interacting with the protocol, and then you can start creating badges and distributing badges right away. And maybe a bit of a background for the start, you know, why why am I calling these uh, badges and not Solbon tokens? So the we see a lot of semblance between, you know, what Solbon tokens can enable and what badges have enabled in the history yeah, of, of humanity in the past, and, and badges have been around for centuries and have been used for all sorts of um, functions, such as we see a few examples here, you know, affiliation, achievements, um, reputation, also, you know, tracking skills, and some examples of, you know, what badges were in the past. We have the, the coat of arms, like in the, in the middle centuries or the middle ages, you know, you're showing your affiliation with um, maybe a, a, a house or uh, some army indicating um, you know, that you were part of this community. Then we have uh, examples such as yeah, police badges, for example, or badges within the um, army that beyond just showing your affiliation might also come with uh, responsibilities tied to them. So for example, if you're, you know, if you've gone through the training to become a police officer and you carry the police badge, 
you you kind of take on the responsibility to step in, in in times of crisis for your community and it also comes with certain permissions um associated with with having uh, this badge so for example in the context of a police badge you know there are certain things that under the law i would say in most countries police officers can do that um people who don't hold a police badge can't do and then we also in the 20th century we have uh, the example of scouts so boy scouts girl scouts um yeah who've, who've come up with i think a very sophisticated uh, structure of badges you know indicating participation in certain events um going down like your your level of achieving a certain uh, skill for example so you might be you're an, an expert and making a, a wood uh, making a fire for example and so kind of building out really sophisticated badge ecosystems and then in the digital world we we have badges and yeah in, in online games um, which also were the the inspiration for the soulbound token uh, or soulbound term in the first place or uh, yeah, one example that is very hotly debated, uh, I think, since last week, the, the Twitter verified badges, um, you know, particularly with, with what's going on on Twitter and this $8 uh, subscription. But I don't want to don't want to get into that. Um, and yeah, and so now in yeah, the 21st century, we want to add uh, the Otter badges to this list. And I'll give you a bit of a background in, in a moment as well. So a few things if we look at this list of badge examples that we um, just saw that are kind of like st strike us that they are very similar across different badge use cases and that is for one badges are earned and not bought and this is something that you know non-transferability in in the soulbound tokens enables as well you know by not being transferable it's something that you you can't uh, trade and you can't buy and you can't sell and so the the value of the badge comes inherently from you know it being earned you know you going through the training of becoming a police officer for example and um, then it's always granted in the context of an organization so it a badge doesn't stand in isolation but it's you know within an, an organization so for example you know if you're a member of a dao then your dao membership badge exists within the context of this particular dao and what reputation or permissions or responsibilities it carries is also specific to the community within which it was granted. And then also, importantly, badges are very simple at their core. They're objects with a name. We also see this replicated in you know, the digital um, world where our badges also are you know, at their core very, very, very yeah, simple constructs. And um, you know, what can badges be, be used for? And here's a, a few ideas and concepts, and I can talk to a bit more, you know, the practical applications that we're seeing in our private beta at the moment. Um, but just to, to quickly cover on these, so we think that badges can enable better membership models, so particularly in, in tokenized communities and, and DAOs at the moment, um, where membership is often defined as, you know, having a certain ERC-20 token or maybe just having joined Discord, um, and badges can really, yeah, build more nuanced um, yeah, systems of membership. Then they can also serve as non-financial rewards and recognition. A lot of interactions in DAOs these days are, are financialized. And you could argue that there's a certain degree of hyper-financialization in, in Web3 in, in general at the moment. And, and yeah, badges enable a, a suite of non-financial applications. Um, then a couple of examples include, for example, onboarding quests that end with a badge that you know, identify you as somebody who's gone through this process and then allow other members in the community to also recognize you as such, right, and be able to, to, to determine based on you holding this badge that, you know, you've completed a certain uh, onboarding quest, for example, and kind of can assess your reputation. And then um, also very importantly, we think that uh, badges can create, yeah, as more nuanced uh, governance mechanisms, but especially um, alternatives to the kind of one token, one vote, governance system that we see as the dominant system in a lot of DAOs these days and also starting to see more and more communities move away from. So Radical DAO, for example, is moving away from it. The Optimism community is uh, moving away from just the system with the, the, the Citizen House. Uh, within the Sushi Swap community, there are discussions to move away from it. So we see a lot of significant communities kind of reevaluating. you know, is this the best um, governance mechanism or are there other mechanisms that we could use? And then on um, also on a very practical layer, badges, given their non-transferability, 
unlock a lot of uh, or can unlock access permissions. You know, you can use them as a key. And, you know, if I know if I give you a badge and I know you can't give it to somebody else, then that's something that very practically um, could serve as a key. And um, yeah, I'm just going to very briefly touch on this. But so as mentioned, you know, we were building the EIP 4973. And uh, on top of that, we're building um, the protocol, which also comes with a few additional functionalities, such as um, there's an expiry date, for example, within a badge. So badges can turn inactive. Um, communities can reassign and revoke badges as well. So um, for example, if somebody uh, acts counter to what a community would expect of them, the community can also kind of disassociate itself from the carrier of a badge. And then baked into the um, EIP 4973 is also what we call consensual minting. Um, so basically, the, the only way for you to have a badge is if you and the issuer at, at some point both have expressed you know, consent to this transaction. And there's two mechanisms for that. So one, um, which we call the allow list flow, which we'll see in a moment as well, is um, where basically I as the issuing entity, so let's say the DAO, put you as the recipient on an allow list, and then the next step, step, you can go and claim your badge and thereby expressing consent to having this badge. Um, another flow would be the request flow, where I create a badge as the community, and then you can see this badge and request to get access to it, thereby giving me upfront consent, and then I can airdrop it to you. Um, and, and why is this important? Because at the moment, you know, we're that there is merit to a discussion around negative reputation tokens, but we're focusing on you know use cases that that this doesn't evolve and then also on the user experience side consent also implies awareness um or should at least and so you know i think we've probably all seen and, and received random uh, nfts in our wallets and so this is an, an alternative to just receiving random airdrops and so with this being said i would actually like to kind of jump into the um yeah the the demo and, and give you a visual um, Q4 for what we're building, and maybe I put a quick stop here and ask if there's any question on anything that I mentioned so far. I'll jump in with a quick one if no one else has any for now. I was just wondering, in terms of uh, EIP 4973, so just what's the kind of the status and the progress of that right now? Is there a sense of roughly when you think it will actually uh, go to go to vote? So. I can't comment on when I think it's going to go to a vote because um, I, I, I I can't say at the moment. But we're uh, I would say towards the end of kind of the the feedback receiving stage. There has been a lot of feedback that we received. Um, there, there's another token standard, um, EIP five one nine two, which is kind of the um, minimum viable uh, Solvent token implementation, which is very similar to EIP four nine seven three, except that it kind of excludes the consensual minting and this one is already finalized um, and EIP 4973 uh, is also kind of in the finalization process I would say. Okay thank you. Awesome then let me jump into this and maybe a, a couple of words before we, we dive into this, you know, where do we stand right now? So we uh, we launched on Optimism mainnet in August, and we're in a private beta phase at the moment. And also very excited to work with the with uh, yeah, the, the Scurve team. Um, you know, Eugene and, and Renee, we, we just issued your, your RAF token uh, this week. So I'm also very, very excited to, you know, support you and on, on getting uh, getting you started with badges. And um, we have a, yeah, 20 plus communities that we're working with at the moment and onboarding new communities at a regular basis. And what we are going to see here is kind of our demo environment, um, that, which most of what we're, what we're seeing is, is live. But there are cute, like a few cool features that I want to also show, share here that are coming up. And yeah, with that being said, what we're seeing here is what we call the, the Otterverse. And within the Otterverse, you can you know, see different communities. Uh, so for example, Radical, or here there's a nouns-inspired community. Each community has kind of its own space. And so for example, if we jump into the Otter space and um, community, you can see you know, what badges exist 
within the community um, you can also then see you know how many people hold a given badge so kind of learn about the structure of the community bring kind of the the DAO structure on chain um, you can also manage integrations if you are the um, if you are the administrator of the community and how that works I can also speak to you in a moment and um, you can yeah you can manage um, different in integrations that we have so for example we have an integration with snapshot which you know enables a variety of use cases on the governance side with badges um, where you can for example decide okay do I want to have one vote per badge or do we want to create a different um, voting system where maybe people who have a higher degree of involvement within the DAO given their higher degree of involvement should have a higher representation within governance and let's say the sole badge here is um, a badge for for really key contributors and then we say okay this badge should have a higher share in governance so you can really experiment and, and create a variety of um, yeah, governance or, or voting systems with with badges beyond just the kind of one token one vote erc20 uh, based governance that i that i previous, previously mentioned then we also have an integration with Guild, so uh, you can token gate a variety of you know Discord documents, etc., with with uh, badges as well. Um, we're also launching Collab Land soon, and um, yeah, we also uh, support Gnosis Safe. So we typically recommend that uh, the access key to outer space, which we call the RAF token, which is a normal ERC721. So our protocol has both ERC721 and ERP4973. And is held in a Gnosis safe so that multiple members of the community can also manage the badge system. So the key question, obviously, is you know how do you create a badge and how do you distribute it? And so if I jump into the creation flow, then we see okay the first part, as mentioned, is kind of you know you need to connect the wall that has the raft token. So this is kind of the the access key, and a raft is a, a group of orders. So that's kind of the the wording connection. Um, you know we're order themed. Uh, big fans of, of orders and then you create the badge and as i previously mentioned the badge fundamentally is quite uh, quite simple so it has a name so let's say i want to create the soul badge it has a piece of artwork like an nft so let's say i want to use our you know our in-house designed uh, soul badge order here and then you can also um, tie an expiration date to a badge um, and this is optional you can also say badge should never expire and to give you an example of how this is uh, being used, we have season passes. So we're working, for example, with the Bankless um, DAO community and uh, on, on supporting the, the next uh, upcoming seasons, um, yeah, season passes as, uh, as badges. And then these passes expire at the end of the season. And during the season, they give you access um, to a variety of things. And once the season expires, the badge itself doesn't disappear, but it has an active state that is rendered inactive. And then in downstream integrations, it will be yeah, disabled essentially so it doesn't give you the same benefits anymore but we can also say that a badge never expires and then once you've kind of completed this design you bring the badge on chain as mentioned we're on optimism so this process takes just a few seconds and it's also very efficient in terms of gas fees and then the next step in the process is the allow list so um as i mentioned this is kind of the the first um, distribution flow mechanism that we're, we enabled and we're launching the request flow soon as well but so let's say you have this badge and then you want to add um, different members of your community to this allow to the allowance of this badge and then you can say okay this wallet address or this ENS should be eligible to claim this badge and we add them to this list and then once this is completed we have a list of unclaimed badges and then there's a URL for every badge that we can share with the community and the people who are eligible for the badge, and then they can go and claim the badges. And so this, up until now, was kind of the flow of you know, of, you know, a DAO administrator, let's say a community manager, for example. Um, and then if we kind of switch perspective into the shoes of somebody who's you know on the contributor side and wants to claim their badge, then I yeah just open the link that I received. I connect my wallet. I um, connect to yeah optimism or we're also uh, looking at launching on mainnet ethereum soon and then i can see okay i'm eligible to claim this badge i claim the badge and then given the consensual minting mechanism i have to sign a transaction here and there's a small gas fee uh, in the magnitude of some like 10 15 cents and then the transaction is completed 
And I can see the badge in my wallet because the EIP4973 is actually backward compatible with ERC721. But within Auto Space, every user also automatically has a profile that they can create where they can see their badges. Um, they're going to be able to see what communities they belong to and like summarize. Um, and yeah, basically create their, their own profile. And this is a, yeah, a brief walkthrough of what we're building. As mentioned, you know, this is uh, most of what we're seeing is live. Some some parts uh, we're still working on, on launching, but yeah, would love to um, answer any questions that that anybody has. Yeah, thank you so much for presenting, Lucas. And yeah, for anyone in the in the audience, please feel free to to raise your virtual hand to kind of jump in a queue. I guess one one thing to just kick off, it'd be interesting to hear about what are some of the uh, applications that you've seen that you can share, uh, and especially if there's any use of badges in the direction of, say, education or, or knowledge management or anything that's kind of relevant to the general uh, SCURF world. Yeah, thanks, Eugene. Very, very relevant question. So out of the, I would say, I I showed a few examples in, in a slide earlier, but in terms of what are we seeing in the yeah, immediate future or already being applied, there are four broad buckets that we have within like our private beta at the moment. So the first one is around membership um, and incentives. So that's you know DAOs uh, having a badge that identifies you as a member of the DAO and that might identify you as a certain like like holder of a certain role within the DAO. So for example, you're um, you know on the community guild or you're on the writer guild or on the developer guild, for example. Um, and then also incentives, you know. To, to identify you, for example, as somebody who was an early member of the DAO or who has completed a certain level of activity within the DAO. The second um, kind of bucket builds directly on the first one, which is this matter of um, access management. So, for example, via the Guild integration or Collabland integration, you know, if I have a badge, um, I get access to certain things. Um, let's say a Discord, and if I have a badge that identifies me as a certain role, maybe um, as part of a certain op, uh, pod or guild, then I get access based on that specific badge, so we can kind of like stack these permissions on top of each other. The third one um, revolves specifically about, around governance, and um, so basically, as you know, an alternative, uh, as I mentioned on you know the the one token one vote system, and um, to give you a practical example, we're working with the Radical DAO. That some of you might be familiar with on, on the distribution of influence work stream, where in, in very brief terms the the DAO will be uh, like represented on, across its different levels and in, in badges, and then the um, the treasury will like delegate rad tokens to different members based on kind of their role, and thereby enabling them to have more influence within governance. Um, and then. But, but other models, so this is one way this could be applied, but other models, for example, as illustrated by the snapshot integrations, you can also have direct votes based on outer space badges. Um, and then the fourth, fourth bucket, and, and Eugene, you, you pointed at this, is around educations and, education and credentials. And so working, for example, with the Token Engineering Academy that I guess some uh, here are also familiar with, or also obviously yourselves, and um, and in the case of the Token Engineering Academy, for example, there are uh, yeah, badges being issued for to indicate you know, completion of a course, um, identif identifying you as you know a member of a cohort, and yeah, it's, this is also a very interesting um, use case for us because you know coming starting out in the kind of like DAO focused direction, it wasn't like on our immediate you know this is the next step, but then we've seen a lot of interest coming from kind of the the education credentials side. And so we're also yeah very excited to learn more about that and, and get them all more involved there. And I hope this answered the question. Yeah, no, that was really helpful. Thank you for uh, for providing that overview. Um, yeah, th Joel, I think I saw you jump off mute before. I don't know if you wanted to jump in with a question or if anyone else has. Just want to pause for a moment because I have a bad habit of just constantly asking more questions otherwise. I guess, oh, Paul, please. Yeah, I was just going to jump in real quick and uh, more probably uh, in the future uh, as opposed to right now. Um, but it seems like right now kind of badge issuing is, or that permission list is a, um, that's a very manual process uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, this would, we could set up a badge where if one does X series of behaviors, 
uh, that could feed that? Is that something that you are looking to do? Or do you see there being negative consequences to kind of like this automation of badge issuance? Yeah, so that's a um, very interesting point. And so it's definitely something that, that we're thinking of, and it's also on our roadmap. So what we currently have, we call kind of like human attestation. So basically, you know, one person, let's say I'm a community manager attesting to the fact that, you know, by, by handing out a badge, let's say I, 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 I put you on the allow list, Paul, for one of our badges, thereby kind of attesting to the fact that, you know, you are a person. And we think this can also have um, interesting implications for kind of civil resistance. You know, if you have multiple communities attesting to the fact through human attestation that, you know, you are a person, the, the, the chance of you actually being a person, a single person also um, increases. But we are also looking into um, what we refer to as automated attestation, where, um, yeah, we're, we want to develop a, a questing system. Uh, that can, you know, take into regard a certain on-chain activity, but also a certain off-chain activity. And then if you complete certain actions, then you become eligible for a badge and can um, can claim it. So this is definitely something that we're, we we have in our radar and that we're also uh, investigating. And in terms of the acts, oh, uh, Joe, please, if you wanted to jump in. No problem. Um, Lucas, you said something about the badges. Previously, you said um, probably when someone goes against the community's requirements or community's laws or guides or rules that guide the community, that the badge could be withdrawn from the person. Like, does it does that sound like a consequence? Does that mean that there's a consequence for everything that you do that doesn't work in line with the community's desires? Sorry, Joel, the, the last uh, few words I, I missed, unfortunately. Could you just repeat that? As a consequence for? Yes, yeah, is there a consequence for going against or doing things that are not in line with the community's requirements? Okay. Um, so the, the, there's the, the question of permanence was I think very yeah very intensely debated around Sobon tokens. You know what if I get a badge and do I want to keep it forever, or if I if I don't want to, what happens if I don't want to keep it forever, or if you know we gave a badge to somebody and we don't um, you know no longer see uh, you know hold the same values of that person for example, and so on a, on a practical level and we think that there are a lot of you know from these debates that happened around Sobon tokens there are a lot of implementation challenges and, and problems to address and you know we try to be very practical about it. And so that implies for us two things: one, um, to just like to destroy a badge, only the the holder of the badge can destroy a badge. So you you can burn a badge that you received. So you can't just be airdropped a badge and you know you're stuck with it. You can always um, at least you know within order space badges you can always burn a badge. And um, and then communities can disassociate themselves from a badge. So they can't burn the badge per se, but they can kind of decouple themselves and, and deactivate this badge so that let's say you have um you have a token gating base based on this badge for example and then you want to say okay this person has you know violated one of our service rules for example then you can disable this access specifically for this badge and so you know does does this mean that there are consequences for for your actions within communities which is kind of like what i understood was the the second part of your question joel from the outer space side, you know, we don't want to be prescriptive. We want to be, we want to create a yeah, tool stack that is flexible and that enables communities to kind of use badges in a way that they see fit and that fits into you know their model of governance, into their model of community management. Um, and for us, it's important to just you know kind of enable uh, communities to to yeah to apply different use cases and to create different structures without being prescriptive and that's why we kind of want to or where we bake in this flexibility within the protocol i hope that addresses the the question yeah thank you thanks joel and i guess related to that is there any thinking in terms of um because I, I know you were just saying, uh, from your perspective, you want to see outer space as a non-prescriptive tool. So you don't want to just have like, you must use it this way in terms of governance or, or leave it. Uh, but from uh, potential kind of 
groups that can find a way to use this to have ne negative implications on a community. So more to, to find ways to kind of not use this for the pro-social outcomes, which I think is what most of the draw is at the moment. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of the general concerns with SBTs is, oh, this could be its own addition to surveillance states and everything. And I see how like the consent uh, mechanism is meant to also uh, potentially limit some of those concerns. Um, but theoretically, I guess, could you see, uh, or has there been any discussion of, of um, you know, potential, if you find out that, hey, if you pair this kind of soul bad, uh, soulbound token with this specific implementation of it, that it only can lead to bad social outcomes? It, like, are, are those kind of discussions even coming up of like, what are the constructs of this that, uh, that can drive us in ways that can be, you know, like negative policing in the community? Or what are some frameworks of like, hey, you know, if you mainly issue SBTs for like, good job for doing that pro-social thing, as opposed to like being like, boo, you get an SBT for saying you're bad, and now you have to wear that as a badge of shame and like things like that. Um, you know, are there, yeah, just wondering what, what, what you're seeing kind of the discussions on that and uh, both with, with Otter Space and just the, the kind of folks working on SBTs more broadly. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um... So I would say in, in you know the folks working on SPTs more broadly, it's definitely you know part of the discussion. And I think it's healthy that this part of the discussion also exists. And you know, I personally think you know there is merit to the discussion of you know, should we have negative reputation tokens in, in, in some world? Um I don't I don't have a definitive answer. Um you know, I think it's the the, the long-term implications of what we we can do with with soulborn tokens, I think are very, yeah, very broad um, and, and can go many ways. I think on the on the outer space side, we're we're trying to to yeah be and, and and stay practical, and that's why I was saying before that you know a lot of these are kind of implementation challenges and that can be addressed with implementation. And so I would say at the moment we haven't really faced a a, a setting where you know the the badges were uh, used for for negative reputation or, or negative uh, outcomes, let's say. And I think. We also, you know, in the design, opted to to kind of provide some protection for the recipients, right? So that it's only the recipient who can who can burn the badge. And as mentioned before, you know, you have to um, consent to receiving it. So there's no like no, no uh, airdrop against your will. And so I think this already kind of uh, provides some protection. And then could I imagine that someone, you know? still figures out a way to use this in a, in a negative setting the composability is a key functionality of you know web3 and it's also part of what makes it um great but you know with any technology and i'm not the first one to say this right you know it can go in positive directions and can go into negative directions and i also think that you know um you know taking a humble uh, perspective that we, we don't know yet where this journey is going to take us and all the use cases and applications haven't been thought of and so I could imagine, you know, that there are like scenarios in which, um, yeah, negative negative outcomes might might happen. But I, I would say, um, on the outer space side, we're, yeah, we're we're you know we're trying to create an environment and and also a tool stack that is um, beneficial for for all parties in, involved, and kind of comes with protections for the individual. Yeah. And I see that there were some messages in the chat. Um, yeah, so one direct question was, could you share the deck? Uh, and, and we'll be writing up a, a summary post and we'll have the YouTube video up. So let us know if you just want us to share the deck directly uh, with Renee and anyone else who requests it, uh, or if you want us to put that up with the with the YouTube link uh, and, and have it publicly shared when we post that later. Um, and yeah, Renee did mention having reputation badges to help recognize contributors and implement governance will solve a lot of problems for us. And I guess just in case anyone hasn't heard on how we are thinking of uh, this kind of initial uh, potential trial on the scurf side of, of experimenting with otter space is, you know, we just had this writing cohort finish that was a joint program with Taptive. Uh, and uh, Paul and I were chatting with someone who's working on a project where they will need to hire writers at some point next year. And when we told them about the writing cohort and just exploring ways we can collaborate together, they mentioned, of, oh, I would actually be interested in knowing who had finished this program uh, as a potential way to recognize folks they could, uh, you know, reach out to and, and interview for the kind of writing uh, opportunities that will be uh, relevant there. So uh, that's where we immediately got excited and figured, hey, this is an interesting way to track, hey, you've completed this kind of writing workshop that we're doing. Uh, and I know we're generally thinking of what are the 
various alternative versions that we can run and what can that look like and what can these different badges represent as we iterate around this. Uh, so yeah, very much excited for thinking about, uh, you know, what, uh, what these badges can be used to recognize people's learning pathway and skill acquisition pathway in writing uh, around and, and discussing research. Um, I'll pause for a moment in case anyone else had questions. Otherwise, I did have a thing on access management. Uh, but yeah, I'll, yeah, Paul, please. Yeah, I wanted to uh, maybe jump in with, so I have like a billion, like I'll call them little tiny questions, uh, but maybe the better way to ask the question is, uh, what are some best practices that uh, you are seeing emerge in kind of the use of these badges? And for a little bit of context for where that question is coming from is A, yes, working with Eugene and SCURF and like, how can we use these to potentially um, recognize contributions or quest completions? Uh, but also I originally, I come from academia, right? Uh, a lot of the learning management systems in um, education right now have like, like badging is very ex hot there as well, right? Um, but they're so micro um, and they're non-transferable. Like, And so um, I'm interested in the kind of best practices of do we reward uh, or, or does it make sense to reward every little tiny behavior that a person does? And so one amasses thousands upon thousands of badges and maybe that no longer solves problems for us or um, yeah, so best practices is kind of the way to manage all those questions. Yeah, yeah, thanks Paul. Um, so I think I definitely have a few that I can share and but I want to touch maybe on the point, the, the second kind of point of the, the world of, you know, are, are we going to be in a world of, of uh, badge inflation and, you know, a world with an extraordinary number of, of badges. And so I think it's um, too early to to say on that front, just because, you know, I think we're very early um, on, on, on Solban tokens. In, in general, but um, I think you know there are already some trends that that can be uh, seen on that side with regards to you know aggregating. Um, so if we if we track micro contributions, for example, there might be a layer of aggregation where different contributions will then kind of culminate into a higher order um, badge. So you could have you know what what does membership mean? Is it if you've completed X? out of uh, Y um, contributions, and then thereby you kind of become eligible to receive a higher level of membership. So I think we, aggregation in the long term will be something that we, we will see um, where the communities, yeah, the community in, in, in broad terms and the individual communities will settle on tracking micro, micro contributions or very high level concepts. I think from at least the outer space side, again, I would say we're, we're, we, we don't want to be prescriptive in that sense. So we see both. We see communities, you know, um, going for uh, tracking or, or rewarding like very small contributions um, to other communities who start right away with, you know, this is a member and this is a certain role, um, which might, you know, encompass a lot of different interactions. And so I don't, I, I would say it's, uh, it's, it's too early to to see kind of what if if there is going to be I, I, actually I don't think there is going to be a single answer to this. There's multiple ways, and then with regards to kind of um, best practices today, there are um, yeah a few. So for one, we we recommend uh, holding the uh, the RAF token, which is the token that gives you access at least with an outer space um, in a multisig. So just you know you might. Want to have multiple people who control the badge ecosystem you might want to have multiple people um also kind of distributing the workload across multiple people also the workload is you know it's it's, it's higher in the initial setup and um, so there's also something to keep in mind that you know maybe a, a small group is, is responsible for the initial setup kind of getting the system up and running and then uh, you kind of distribute the, the responsibility thereafter then also you know as we're dealing with with yeah, data that we're putting on the blockchain and um, a certain, you know, eternal uh, track record, we've also seen that, you know, it, it makes sense to kind of come up with the design um, in, you know, in terms of the badge system, but also very practically the design of the badges and the visuals and the titles, etc., kind of in advance. Um, because you want to, you know, you want to create a badge and then already have it, maybe it's not perfect on the first try, but you, you know, because we're creating such long-lasting, uh, yeah, track records on on chain, kind of make make sure that the the first iteration that's on chain is already like eighty percent of the way there, for example. 
Um, so we, we're seeing also demand for kind of like testing environments, let's say, where you know I can create some badges um, and experiment first before kind of creating the, the final implementation. Which in the context of Sobon tokens, you know, is something like uh, on, on an implementation level that's also very interesting and also needs to be addressed. Um, I see that there's a question on uh, best practices. Yeah, I'll read Renee questions out, Renee's question out. How have people handled uh, badging so far over time? Is it standard to require people to renew their badges? And has anyone proposed the decay rate that makes sense? So yeah, I think that's a, that's also a very interesting question. And I think that the the first question is, you know, should like do our our communities opting for um, forever badges or kind of expiring badges and I think so far it has been it has been mixed so we've seen both and um, I think a model that looks very uh, promising is and, and we see this across many DAOs right this like working in seasons um, you know is it uh, a season is a quarter maybe and so a season lasts for three months for example and then kind of having a badge system or at least a part a sub stack like of the badge system kind of also following this natural rhythm within the DAO, I, th I could see. Um, and then with regards to like renewing, and in, in, in that world there, I think you have this like natural renewal process. Um, on the batch design, like the technical implementation side, we've also come across, you know, suggestions in, in with regards to kind of having a badge kind of decay. So, you know, not as a, like a, a binary, you know, on off, but maybe there's an inherent value that kind of uh, decreases and again there's so many different ways of implementing it so it's also going to be super interesting to see what kind of people maybe uh, build on top of the protocol or, or other implementations that might come from the from the token standard um but so i think at the moment there's no yet no best practice that has established itself and this, we see different communities experimenting with, um, with different implementations i hope this answers the question renee and then i see harvesto uh, has is raising his hand so maybe we can go there. Hello, um, good evening from this side. Um, hi, Jen, hi, Paul, hi, Lucas. Can you hear me very well? So, sorry, at least on my end, um, the, the audio is coming through um, a bit like uh, I, I, can't, I can't discern it uh, very well. Is it better now? Um, a tiny bit, yeah. Okay. Um, so I I joined along the road, so I may have missed some of the points. But I, I think it's great we are having this conversation. Um, I, I learned about author space. Um, I think two or, or three weeks ago, through um, Crypto Sapiens podcast. They've been focusing on um, decentralized identities, and I think they they made um, a feature, their yeah, podcast about author space, and I I thought it was fascinating, you know. So yeah, I'm glad we're having this conversation. My question, my first question is, um, um, why are we having this conversation? Like, why is Curve having this conversation with author space? Like, are there any intended um use cases and uh, it's directed to either Paul or Eugene and I have a second question too. Um, what are the possible drawbacks in using um, these badges or slow bound tokens for um, participation um, or rewarding participation and that's directed to you Lucas. Thanks. Yeah thanks for the question. I would maybe uh, hand it over to Eugene and Paul then uh, at the start and just maybe as a side note, we'll, um, I'm going to share the deck and the slides as well. So, uh, you know, also if you missed something, um, there'll be opportunity to, to catch up, I think. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah, so to, to just quickly comment. So the initial use case that we're thinking uh, is around uh, sort of educational credentialing, sort of, I guess, is the closest, even though we're not really considering it an educational pathway as of yet. For now, it was more of community building around the writing cohort. But we're especially thinking of, uh, you know, how can 
either initially completing the writing cohort indicate that, hey, you like writing, so you can be applicable for writing jobs. So then people who are interested in hiring writers can look for, you know, the the people with badges of a uh, SCRF plus ta- captive writing cohort or something like that. Uh, so that's one immediate one. And then how that can evolve is potentially thinking, you know, well, if you complete multiple series of intentionally structured writing cohorts, can that actually signify of like, hey, you picked up a skill along the way. And that can be its own type of badge. Not only did you complete four cohorts, uh, but, you know, we now think you've acquired a skill or something like that. So you could tell by my vagueness in that answer that we don't like the latter one is not a concrete thing. Uh, and Paul, please feel free to jump in if you have any. Uh, additional thoughts uh, there, but I think there's a lot to explore, and w- this is hopefully beginning the conversation of uh, what does it make sense for SCURF uh, in this kind of environment to experiment with a with a, a tool like Otter Space. Yeah, I think maybe just to add on just a little bit that also just in um, for months probably uh, the idea of like unlocks or uh, how do you give people pathways into uh, responsibilities and opportunities into SCURF, um, those have been general conversations. Uh, we've had lots of conversations about reputations, um, how do these reputation get developed in this space and whatnot. And I think um, things like badging is a potential uh, solution or a indication of how one might uh, accumulate and signal uh, those types of things. So I think that's just kind of of interest to SCURF in general. Plus, like, there's research uh, that needs to get done in this space. I have to imagine, like, I, I don't want to speak for Lucas, but I imagine that many of the decisions that are being made are um, research-based or creating opportunities for new research to show up. So um, I think that that is also just of interest to SCURF. Yeah, um, yeah, I, def- I definitely agree. Um, to, to on, on, the, on the point with uh, you know that there's research to be done and opening up new space for for research, Paul, um, and then so the way uh, correct me if I'm wrong that I understood the question was kind of what what are uh, you know use cases for how badges could be used to encourage participation, um, and so I think kind of porting from something that we already see in a pre-badge world like discord and discord roles and people kind of identifying themselves with you know discord roles um you know this kind of building reputation around that right like you have, you have multiple roles and uh, multiple tags kind of identifying you as maybe a member of a certain uh, community a geographic community for example or a certain uh, guild or or pod or um, a certain like uh, level of adoption you might say so you know if you if you're using a the product you know you have a um, maybe some some power users who are like using it very actively and um, other users who are using it maybe more uh, yeah more infrequently um and so all these can kind of uh you know be be structured also on chain with with badges and then you could say um you know you cl- you get a badge if you have achieved a certain level of usage for example so i think um we we see it on in, in the defi world a little bit where you know um, you know, are you an expert user of a certain protocol, for example? Or are you a beginning user? And then there is an incentive for you to also, you know, in certain contexts, identify as somebody who has significant knowledge, right? So and this comes back to the point that, that Eugene mentioned, mentioned on, on education and credentials. So kind of being able to testify uh, or to, to indicate that you have certain um, knowledge is a way already to encourage uh, participation via badges, I would say. And then maybe uh taking from a different example uh you know from my own uh world of warcraft uh, background which i think is you know relevant in a world of, of speaking of about soulbound um you know world of warcraft had the the titles that you could uh, earn for your character and um i do remember that you know like having a title like there was this kingslayer title uh, in frozen throne or wrath of lich king and um you know people would do a lot to to kind of get different titles and this definitely was an encouraging effect on on usage and i um and i think you know the same is playing out within you know the the dao world and 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 the, and the broader world um you know we we i would say as as humans we're doing a lot of things um and participating in a lot of things to then ultimately uh, gain something that becomes part of our reputation Absolutely, thank you, Lucas. Uh, and uh, one one quick final question: uh, Just uh, has anyone used uh, uh, Otter Space for creating access management for bounties, so limiting who can apply for specific bounties? 
So um, we actually launched a like a like a, a community or um, yeah, alliance of uh, DAO tooling providers um, uh, called the DAO Kit. And uh, for example, there's also the the Wonderverse team um, in in the DAO Kit. And so we're working closely with them on uh, yeah, settings like that. Uh, so basically, you know, using badges, for example, to uh, validate your eligibility for a certain bounty, for example. Um, or gating the access to it. So this is definitely something that uh, that's on our, our horizon um, and that we're working to implement. Cool, yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for joining uh, and presenting to the community and answering all the questions. And thank you to everyone who, who hopped in for the conversation today and have a wonderful rest of your Thursday, everyone. Thanks Bye. so much for having me.